Hey BC, it's Jonathan, your cheap and cheerful record collector. Hope everybody's doing well out there and enjoying this beautiful fall weather. Uh, the best time of the year here in Maine. Uh, leaves are changing, it's just beautiful out. And um, the only problem with fall is that winter's right behind it. Anyway, uh, I was watching a video today of uh, Melinda Murphy. We all know Melinda. And um, it hit home for me. Um, so basically about six years ago, I opened a booth at an antique mall in uh, Maine here and I started selling records. What happened is I basically retired from work and I have a bunch of records. My wife said, maybe you ought to open them all and get a hobby and do something with them. So I started buying collections and selling records. And I would buy collections and I would spend one, two, three dollars a record. I buy 500 records at a time. I took each record, I cleaned them front and back. I took a uh, Lysol wipe and I wiped down the covers back and front so they were clean, fixed any repairs, put them in a new um, paper sleeve. And if I bought them for two or three bucks, I'd sell them for four, five, and six dollars. Um, I opened my store in June and I basically would like that. My first, uh, my first start selling, I was selling records for two, four, and six dollars. Um, basically, I looked at the uh, discog price, medium price, and if it was um, a little beat up, I'd take a buck off. If it was really good, I'd put it at the discog uh, medium price, pretty much. And that went on for a couple of years, and I could buy collections at decent prices, and uh, enough so that I could make a profit by selling what I bought. Um, and I wasn't making huge money, but it was something to do, and brought in a little bit of cash. And about... Two years ago, prices just started to go crazy. People started thinking uh, everything they had was gold. I mean, it might have been brass, but they thought it was gold. Uh, it's a Beatles album. It's got to be worth a lot of money. And I said, no, they printed hundreds of millions of those copies. Yeah, show me a first pressing in, a sh in shrink and still sealed. That's worth something. But everybody thought everything they had was worth a lot of money. Typical example, about a year or so ago, a friend of my wife, the couple, they were moving from Maine to uh, Phoenix, and he wanted to sell his collection. So I went over his house, he had about 400 records, and they were in good condition, and they were good stuff. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't um, Led Zeppelin uh, 2 RL or anything fantastic, but the basic records in good condition, and he had about 400 records, and we talked for a while. I said, what do you want for them? He goes, I don't know, what do you think they're worth? I said, well, if you took them to a local dealer, like a record store, he'd probably give you $1,000 for them. Uh, I could do like 1500 bucks. And he said, nah, couldn't, couldn't possibly do that. I said, okay. And I walked out. As I walked out, I turned around. I said, 2000. That's what I brought with me. He goes, no, can't do it. I said, fine. He said, let me think about it. I said, all right. So I called him back about two days later. And I said, oh, did you uh, think about it more? What do you think? He goes, no, I sold them yesterday for $3,500. This is 400 records. That's like not almost not eight and a half dollars a record so that guy was taking those records eight and a half bucks he was probably selling them for 16 to 20 to 25 dollars and that's why the prices have to keep going up and up and up and last um in june actually this past june i closed my uh, booth at the antique mall after five years i just couldn't find stuff that i could buy at a decent price that i could clean and flip over and resell at a price that i thought was reasonable Prices are getting insane. I've seen uh, Barbara Streisand albums for $12. John Denver albums for $14. I mean, just ridiculous stuff. However, today's video is... Uh, uh, um, I bought a couple of used records, some new records, and some CDs I thought I'd share with you. I went to visit my daughter who lives over in uh, Amherst, Mass. And she took us to this uh, small town near there. Um... Montague, and there's a record, there's a book, big bookstore, which is great, and a record store. So my wife and daughter went to the bookstore, I went to the record store, dug around, and found a couple of things. Um, paid a little more than I probably should have, but I'm happy to have them. First one was Ace. I've been looking for this Bob Weir album for quite a while now. He had two copies. One was in pretty lousy condition. This one looked pretty good, but it's okay. But there are plenty of scratches. 
Plenty, I cleaned it, but still plenty of pops and nicks. Um, the original green label from Warner Brothers. And it plays okay. It's a great album. I really love the album. Uh, I wish it was cleaner, but uh, I paid 20 bucks for it. And it was more than I should have paid. Uh, the other one, which wasn't in good shape, he wanted $15 for it. So, yeah, the uh, Discog medium price is 26 but still, it could have been cleaner. I would have been happier. Anyway, Ace, Bob Weir. Next record I found, this was cheap. This was like $2, so I jumped all over it. I'm a big fan of uh, Delbert McClinton. This is from 1970. I'm sorry. Got my cheat sheet here. The Bob Weir is from 72. Delbert McClinton's from 1979. Uh, haven't listened to it yet. It looks really clean. But again, um, Plano Love Making, two more bottles of wine, uh, Mesa Blues, just really dig Delbert McClinton. So happy to have this, especially for two bucks. That was really good. That was a good buy. Uh, next one was a record I have been looking for for quite a while. I actually, I bought a collection about a year, a couple of years ago, and it was all um, audiophile recordings. And he had this, but it was a box set of like the original album and outtakes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A big box set worth like a lot of money. So I sold that and I said, someday I'll find just the basic album itself. And it popped up and it's Jennifer Warren's uh, famous blue raincoat, which is her covers of Leonard Cohen songs. There are the two of them together. He sings on one of the songs with her. This is such a great, great album. Um, First, we take Manhattan, Bird on a Wire, Joan of Arc, Ain't No Cure for Love, Song of Bernadette. It's just fantastic. I love her versions of all the songs. I like his versions too, but uh, hers are quite good also. On Cypress Records, nice label, I like that. But yeah, if you, you like Leonard Cohen and you want to hear a different take on his uh, songs, I highly recommend this album by Jennifer Warren's Famous Blue Raincoat. Um... Next one I found, this was another deal, inexpensive, and really happy with this. There's a jazz musician, a saxophone player, name is Phil Woods. Uh, he moved to Europe and Paris in the 70s, I think it was, lived there for a number of years. This is his European Rhythm Machine at the Montreux Jazz Fest. This was uh, from 1970. Um, the other people I don't know, George Gruntz was piano, Henri Textier was bass, and Daniel... Humair was drums. Don't know them, but really like this record. It's a uh, promo, but it's a yellow label. MGM promo, not for sale. So it's sort of cool having a yellow label promo. Um, verges a little bit on free jazz, but not quite. doesn't quite go all the way, which is fine with me. I'm not a big free jazz fan. I'm much more of a hard bop fan. And there's the, the DJ. So it's a good album. Real happy to have this one. And the price was right on that. Um, about a week or so ago, there was a ad in Craigslist for a um, yard sale. So I wrote them a note. I said, do you have any records? They wrote back, oh, yeah, we got records. So I said, great. So I drove up almost a half hour, 45 minutes. And I get there on Friday morning at like 10 o'clock. And there's like no records. So I said to the person, I, I wrote, I thought you said you had some records. Oh, they're in my car. Let me go get them. She goes in the car, brings out five records. I was like, I drove like almost 45 minutes for five records. Nothing there I wanted. So I was pissed off and I left and I went down to, this was in Brunswick, Maine. So I had a little while before some of the record stores opened and I noticed that Bull Moose was open. They opened at 10. I went in there and I was very lucky to find a uh, record. I think this was a record store day uh, release a couple of years ago. I didn't buy it on record store day. I probably should have, but I didn't. I'm glad I did. Found this at, they had it at half price, and it's a Dave Brubeck Time Outtakes. So this is outtakes from the original Time Out album from 1959 um, with Dave Brubeck, Paul Desmond, Eugene Wright, and Joe Morello. A lot of times these outtake things are not worthwhile. This is fantastic. <clears throat> I'm so happy to, you know all these songs, I know all these songs by, just by heart already. Blue Rondo El Turk. Strange Metal Arc, Take 5, um, Three to Get Ready, um, Kathy's Waltz, just fantastic. And just to hear the same songs, but different takes of them, 
and just different, but fantastic. Just really great. And there were three songs that weren't on the original album because two of the songs on the original album were done in one take. So there were no alternative takes. So they added uh, I'm in a Dancing Mood and um, Watusi Jam, both great. And then there's some um, banter they put in, some, which is like sort of a waste to fill out the record. But really love this. Previously, unre previously unreleased takes from the original 1959 session. And there's Time Out Outtakes. So if you um, know Time Out by Dave Brubick, which I'm sure most people do, and you really love it, this is a, if you see this around, I didn't pay much for it. I'm really happy with it. Time Outtakes, Dave Brubeck. And then a night about a week or so ago, I'm on hanging out, looking at the computer, watching TV, and I see that this company, Real Gone Music, is having a sale. So my ears perk up, being the cheap and cheerful record collector I am. And I said, let me check out what they have. First thing that popped up was this, a 2020 release, and it's Tim Buckley. Again, more outtakes. This is The Dream Belongs to Me, rare and unreleased recordings, 1968-1973. So one album was when I think he just finished Happy Sad and was recording a new album. It was in between, or some of them were from the Happy Sad recordings. Um, I'm a big Tim Buckley fan. Um, lucky enough to have seen him in 1968 at the Newport Folk Festival. Um... So he has Song to the Siren, which is on one of those albums, and Sing a Song for You, Buzz and Fly, which is one of my favorite songs by him. So, you know, Tim Buckley started out in the 60s as a real folky, a part of that whole folk revival scene of the 60s, but then went beyond that and did a lot of uh, jazzy stuff, a little electronic stuff, a little spacey stuff, um, but just a great, great two albums, both on that same yellow, uh, two record set. Uh, I said recorded in 1968 in New York and in L.A. and then 1973 in L.A. in Hollywood. Tim Buckley, I'm sure if you don't know Tim, you of course know his son Jeff Buckley. He never, he, I think he said he met, they, he met his son one time and that was it. So no, no real relationship between them, but they're Tim Buckley. Just great stuff. Another record they had on sale. Um, a name I had seen, and I knew the name, but I had never really heard the album or, or heard the music, and I knew of him, so I grabbed it, and it's Little Willie John, and this is his album, the complete R&B hit singles. So these were all recorded starting 1955 through 1961. He recorded for King Records. It's on a yellow label as King Records. King Records also recorded uh, James Brown. Um, Little Willie John, very much of that soul uh, music. Um, started off in a gospel group like a lot of the guy, guys did back in the day. Um, and then got into soul and uh, some blues, very bluesy stuff. Um, all Around the World. The songs that I never heard, The Fever, which is the song um, you know, may know by Peggy Lee. He did his first uh, 1956. It was a number one hit on the R&B charts in 1956. A lot of these songs were hits on the R&B charts, but not so much on the pop charts. Um, he um, was little. He was. He wasn't like one of these guys where they called Little John, where he was like six two. No, he was like five foot four, five foot five. And um, in 1961 or 62, he was with his uh, girlfriend at a bar. And some guy started doing something, whatever, got hostile, and Little Willie John got upset, took out a knife, and stabbed the guy and killed the guy. He was sentenced to prison and sent to Walla Walla, Washington prison there and died at 30 years old of pneumonia in prison. Very sad. First recording was 17 years old, and he was dead by the time he was 30. But uh, a great album. If you love that early soul, just fantastic. I love it, love it, love it. And actually, um, James Brown put out a tribute album to Little Willie John after he died. So they were fairly tight. Um, next album, the last album I'm going to show is uh, also came from Real Gone Music. 
This was a Record Store Day release in 2010, and I didn't buy it, but I'm glad they had it uh, on sale. And it's Tony Joe White, and it's a live album. It's called That One, That On The Road Look, That On The Road Look, live. Um, there really isn't, as they say, much they know about this recording. The tapes were found much many years later. All they know, it says 1971, so the assumption is that it's when he opened up for Creedence Clearwater Revival when they were touring Europe, probably at Royal Albert Hall. Uh, Tony Joe White, if you don't know, wrote Rainy Day in Georgia. He wrote um, uh, Poke Salad Annie. Great, fantastic, funky, funky album. There's the inner sleeve, which is pretty cool. And this is on white, white vinyl. Real Gone Music. Um... Let's see, there's two records. The first album is it's just great. There's only three of them. Tony Joe White playing, doing voice, guitar, harmonica, and the Womp Stomper. <laughs> the Womp Stomper is a uh, um, wah-wah pedal. Uh, also, Donald Duck Dunn on bass and Sammy... Can't make up the last name on drums and Mike Utley on organ and piano. So it's a four piece band, and they are from the from the first get go. They are just smoking. If you like that funky soul, that the New Orleans um, swamp music, he was called the the Swamp Dog. This is a fantastic album. Poke Salad Annie. They do a ten minute version of Poke Salad Annie on this. It's just fantastic. So I really recommend this if you ever see it. Originally just released on CD, and they released it in uh, 2019 for Record Store Day. And I bought two CDs. I don't do a lot of CDs, but again, records are getting harder and harder to find. I'm at Goodwill, and I see this, and I look it up, and it was never released on vinyl, only released on CD. So I grabbed it, and it's Charlie Musselwhite, and it's his album uh, Signature. From 1991. It's great. Love it. Oh, uh, yeah, no reflection. That's Charlie Musselwhite. Great harmonica player out of Chicago. Sort of like uh, in the Paul Butterfield vein, but um, more country, more more country blues. And just great. Charlie Musselwhite. And the other one I picked up was, uh, again, I knew the guy's name, knew like one or two of his hits, but didn't really know had never really dug deep into his uh, catalog. So I was happy to see this one and grab it. And it's Solomon Burke. And this is The Sound of the Blues from 1993. Also never released on uh, vinyl, just on CD. Um, this is this was really great. Uh, um, does all the original uh, uh, versions of all these great songs. Don't Deceive Me, Candy, Cried Out On. I can't read them. Along About Midnight, Pledge of My Love, Rockin' Good Tonight, My Baby. Just, he has a great, great voice and a great blues singer and a sort of jump blues singer. Solomon Burke, singing the blues or soul of the blues, soul of the blues. So there you go. That's my latest finds. Um, I'm really getting frustrated. Some of those records I bought, the used ones like Ace. And the other ones were not as clean. They look clean, but they definitely have a lot of pops and clicks on them. And it's sort of annoying. And I'm really getting to the point where I may be done or getting less and less, buying less and less used records and buying more and more new represses, which I know are clean and in good condition. I know Record Store Day is coming up soon. Um, Black Friday, there are a couple of things I want to get. Not a lot, but two or three albums I think I might pick up there. So let me know, uh, let me hear your comments, what you think about the prices of records today. Are they getting ridiculous? Are they getting to the point where I um, don't need to buy used records for $20, $18, $15, $18, when I can get a new repress for $25, $30 that I know is going to be clean and going to be really good listening? Um, let me know. Give me your comments down below. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Thank you, everybody who are my new subscribers who have uh, clicked on recently. And um, thanks again for watching. And until next time, peace.